Great. Welcome. This is Vince again, Vince Ritchie of Vince Prep, uh, Vince Admissions. I'm an admissions counselor and coach. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the Stanford essays for the graduating class of 2015. This is the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Uh, I'm an alumnus of Stanford University. The diploma is behind my head here. I'm an undergrad um, alumnus. Is that the way to say it? I graduated from the um, School of Humanities and Sciences. My degree is in history, which in theory may have nothing at all to do with my ability to counsel my clients on uh, how to get into the business school. But I did spend uh, three out of four years on campus there at, at Stanford. I lived, I went to Spain my third year. I was, I was in Europe on an exchange program. But anyway, um, it's a place I know well. I spent a lot of time near the business school because the Department of Drama is near the old original business school building. So I did a lot of performing and training with the improv troupe there at Stanford, looking over across the street to the business school. Um, but that's all probably irrelevant and not why you're watching this video today. Uh, you're watching this video today because you're trying to finish or just getting started or uh, anyway, you're thinking about your essays and your application for Stanford. And I do have some ideas about this school. Again, it's not only because I graduated undergrad. Um, it's because I've been helping clients apply there for 10 years. And my results are pretty good uh, for this school, even though it, it's pretty small school. I've had my fair share of clients who've gotten in there over the years. And I've stayed in touch with lots of them because... Uh, it's fun to do so and hear about their lives during and after MBA. So my analysis of the Stanford essays are that essentially uh, they are impossible to fake. You can't, not that you could fake your way into Harvard or Wharton, but I think with Stanford in particular, because the numbers game is just so daunting, 6%, six, percent, uh, six plus percent, around 6% get admitted every year, that's a crushingly uh, depressing statistic for you, the applicant, um, and I think the only way to really get into the school is to do so with integrity. What I mean by that is to don't try to play a game and, and outsmart them by marketing yourself. You're not going to market your way into the Stanford Graduate School of Business. As, as admissions director Derek Bolton says, it's, uh, and he's quoting one of their alumni, it's not a marketing exercise it's an accounting exercise. It's really a time for you to take stock of, of who you are and what you've done and what you want to do and then put together an integrated story that fits the school uh, um, with, again, without trying to. It's just simply, it fits the school because it also fits you. Um, that's really vague advice. So let's get down to concrete business here and let me give you some tips and hints. And I think, again, that's why you're spending your valuable time watching my my little video here and thanks again for doing that here here is my hypothesis about Stanford which is basically that uh, you don't need to try to be well balanced you don't need to try to have a mix of stories that presents you in 360 degrees I'm not saying you should be flat and boring at all but it but if you're someone who has a very deep niche in your life if there's been something that you've been, uh, if, if what matters most to you is related to your goals, and if your goals are in some way connected to your answer to essay three, that's fine. I'm not, and if that's not true, don't, again, don't force it. But my point is, I don't think they're looking for any one kind of applicant. I think they are looking for a truly diverse group of people. Again, because the numbers, it's such a small school that if, if, if they don't have a diverse class, diverse in every way, functionally and culturally, um, and also in terms of people's leadership style and communication style, if it's not truly diverse um, in a small group of 300 plus students per grade, per, per class, um, it's just not going to be a valuable experience for anyone, including the faculty. And if the faculty are unhappy, the admissions uh, hears about it. So the admissions has to please deliver, has to deliver to the faculty an interesting class full of students 
has to deliver to um, the, the alumni an interesting new group, a new fresh meet of, of people to, to add to the small but significant and distinguished alumni network. Um, anyway, the admissions has to please various stakeholders. And they also need to be thinking long term about the health of the school. The place is run on, like any, like any other business, it's run on on, do, on money and the money, the big money is in donations. It's not in the tuition that you pay. They lose money on your tuition. They only make money on their graduate, on their executive programs and other stuff that they're trying to license and sell. Um, sometimes case studies, that's more Harvard. Uh, they make money more on their executive programs. They definitely lose money on the two-year programs. And that's shocking given the tuition that they charge. But that's that's how they do the math, and that's what the, that's the story that they've told me, and, and the story I've heard from them and other schools. So my point is, uh, they they want to take you if what matters most to you, um, what matters most to you, as they say, and I will repeat, um, why matters more than what. So it is an accounting exercise overall to present yourself, but this essay, in essay one. The why part, the qualitative part, is much more important than the answer of what. It's not, your clients sometimes come to me looking for some kind of magic keyword. Is this word convincing and persuasive? Is this, is this what, this one word or this phrase, um, does this actually matter? It doesn't matter. They're not look, that's not diversity. There, 20 people who said that what matters most to them was empathy and 20 people you know five people said you know they don't they don't have a chart I don't think of that they're not tracking the what part it's rather they're looking more to d assemble a diverse class of people who have a variety of why whose reasons for why are, are both compelling and and surprising and interesting my hypothesis my view of the why is that it needs to be very fundamental what I mean by that is that what matters most to you needs to, in some ways, be the thing that keeps you alive. Some of you are going to think that then that you should write an essay about water uh, or air. I'm, I'm not trying to be clever and stupid. No, I don't literally mean, you know, what matters most to me is food because if I didn't eat, I would die. I don't mean this literally. But I mean it's that substance or that quality or that idea or that concept or that life the way of living your life uh, that that sustains you, and that it maybe in some ways uh, helped you survive some difficult times. Another way to look at what matters most to you and why that I like to challenge my clients is sometimes in the mix of stories that they tell, I encourage them to share with me. They may or may not use it in the final essay, but I want to hear about a time when whatever it is that mattered most to them was missing. What happens when you're, you're living without this thing that matters most to you? I'll give you a quick example that, that would be my answer if I was applying to the Graduate School of Business. What matters most to me, definitely, since I've been a conscious adult, a young adult and, and, until the present, is absolutely community. And, and I define community as... Uh, well, what the reason it matters most to me is that it's it's how I survived my childhood. I didn't have a. I'm not going to pretend I had a difficult and terrible childhood more than more than anyone else. I had a privileged childhood in many ways. Um, I had loving parents who are still married. I had um, access to all kinds of great education and great opportunities. I had a very blessed and lucky life, but. Psychically or psychologically, I had to integrate a lot of influences. My parents, God bless them, uh, are very different people. And again, I'm lucky that they are, I'm in the vast minority in California that my parents are still together. Um, but they're just such very different personalities, what interests them, how they think. Um, but they're in that way, in many ways, they're a perfect match. But I had to grow up or I got to grow up in a, in a household that had two very different sort of life views going on at the same time about nearly everything in, in many ways. And I had to kind of make sense of all that and I had to kind of integrate those influences inside of myself, inside of my, my heart and my mind and my, my body and my soul. So I got to find a way to integrate very diverse influences and I won't go into it in this 
little video because it's not about me, it's about you. But my point is community matters most to me because it, I would say actually, let me amend my answer, creating community. It's not just community as a noun, but, but as a process. Making communities matters most to me because it's because the because learning that process, number one, allowed me to feel good about myself and f allowed me to feel integrated and whole in my self. Once I've mastered or at least got a, got a grip on who I was and who and why I'm on this planet, how I survive and thrive and have fun, then I've started the process of creating communities around me. And I've moved around a lot. I'm recording this video in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, I lived in Cal born and raised in California. Undergraduate, you know where that was. I left right after I graduated. I moved to a place I wasn't from, New Orleans, Louisiana. I loved it there. I stayed there five years. I was a teacher. I was running a nonprofit program. Then I went to Virginia and I did some Shakespeare because I missed the theater. Then I went to New York, New York University and studied educational media designed for education. Um, then Tokyo, and I've been here 10 years. Everywhere I go, I find ways to bring people together, again, because it's, it's, it's what I do to get through my day, bring myself together on a daily basis. Um, these disparate influences, these, dif these, these different uh, perspectives that I got the chance to be exposed to growing up and and now I do that around me it's just part of who I am it's like again for me it is like breathing so creating communities making communities matters most to me because um, because it's what keeps me alive I guess at a certain level and that wouldn't be my whole essay I'd give a few examples and I might tell a story about some times in my life where community was absent where the formula or the ingredients just weren't there or my mindset was wrong or I just wasn't in, in a good place for myself and so there was no community in, in my heart. There was no integrated loving feeling bringing these different things together internally and therefore my external stuff was all messed up as well. So I, I, may, I might very well tell a story about a time that community just, just wasn't happening. And that's perhaps more than ever where I realized it's what matters most to me. You see what I'm, where I'm going with this? Stanford doesn't ask for a setback essay like Harvard does. Stan Harvard says, tell us about something you wish you had done better. MIT asks you to share a, a personal setback. Um, Stanford doesn't really ask about failure uh, or setbacks, but that doesn't mean that they don't want to hear about them. I think in some cases you might be able to tell about a setback, if you will, a time that what mattered most to you was, was absent and how you, through a negative example, reconfirmed why this was so vitally important to you might work in your case. I'm just throwing that out there. Um, it's, it doesn't, it's not always just a... My point as well is, is you don't... Your background will be, if you're going to get interviewed and admitted, you're going to have to have an impressive background. That's probably goes without saying. Your achievements and your experiences are probably best told through your application data. The achievements, they can read the resumes very quickly and very with, very, with insight. They know if you're at the top of your game um, in, in almost every industry and in almost every country at this point. They're professionals at this. They don't let students read the essays, and I think that makes a big difference. Um, no offense to the students, but I don't want some 26-year-old person, second-year student who volunteered um, reading my essay and passing judgment on me necessarily. That's my peer. I want a professional reader in Stanford and Harvard and MIT. They have the resources. They have the budget. They can hire the staff, and all the essays are read by professionals, and I think that's, that's nice. So they know how to read your resume and know if you're at the top of your game um, in your given industry, in your given function. And they're going to look for those success stories and those work achievements in your recommendation letters. So in your essays, I guess what I'm saying is don't try so hard to impress them. And, and they say this, and I'm just repeating it uh, for what it's worth. Um, it's true. <laughs> don't, don't try. Just be yourself. It sounds stupid and easy. Okay, great. Thanks, Vince. Why am I wasting my time watching your video? You know, look, if you don't know who you are, I can't tell you. And if you don't know who you are, you're not going to figure it out in the next week or day or a couple months. 
right? And to somehow have an epiphany and make yourself whole through writing these essays. This process might help you, but I'm saying you better know what matters most to you before you start writing this essay, I'm thinking. The only thing I can probably do as a counselor is challenge your logic, critical thinking, um, and storytelling using the tools at my disposal to make sure that your story is actually interesting and believable, right? But I don't give my clients a magic word about what matters most to them. Um, that would be silly and stupid, and anyone who would want me to do that for them, I don't think it has a chance of getting in there anyway. You've got to know who you are to even get step up to the plate uh, and get a good pitch f from this school, okay? Um, essay two, what matters most to you, or sorry, what do you really want to do and why Stanford? Don't write that you want to start a company if you don't really want to start a company. You got it? Don't be all entrepreneurial just because it's Stanford and it's in Silicon Valley. Eh. You know, Poets and Quants has done some great research on this. Look it up, you'll find the data. Stanford has a much higher percentage of the first year class coming from the Goldman Sachs's and the McKinsey's. There's not a lot of people who have startups. There's probably more startups at people type people at Harvard because they're going against the grain. So you don't need to be all entrepreneurial and well, I don't really actually want to start a business, but I think I, Stanford would want me to, so I'll say I do. That's that's a, a word I shouldn't say. That's bad idea. It's bad advice. It's a narrow view of the school, and I think they hate that. They're trying to be a global leadership school for the business community and for leaders in general, public management as well. They don't want you to make up a goal that you don't really believe in, and that's why they've got this word really here. I'm sure they're tired of it. If you've never started, if you're not a serial entrepreneur, if, if, what, if, if you can survive, believe me, running your own business is great being your own boss sounds like a great you know and, and it's hard <laughs> and I didn't invent this industry right I'm an, I've been doing it 10 years I didn't create this industry I'm a relative in some ways a relatively new play, new entrant into this admissions coaching business I believe I've got my own value I believe I'm better at critical critical thinking than most people I've met who do what I do and I know I'm better at storytelling because of my creative arts background um, I've been doing that for 20 years. I, I know what I'm doing. But, you know, so I'm an entrepreneur in that sense, but I'm a safe entrepreneur in another way. I'm, I'm not creating, I'm not, I'm not disruptive, you know. I'm not creating things that are disrupting existing business models and, you know, any of that. Not, not yet, anyway. So what do you really want to do and why Stanford? Just tell them what you really want to do because faking it ain't going to make it. It ain't going to help you. It's going to hurt you. Finally, essay three, um, pick one of these questions. It doesn't really matter which one you pick. Pick one that you've got the best story to tell. And I would say in this case, my one piece of crystal advice on this one is push the process more than the result. Stanford, touchy-feely, organizational behavior type school where the way things are done is just as important, if not more important, than the final result and the bottom line. I mean, look at the research coming out of the Stanford faculty, right? It's some very soft and fuzzy stuff. Um, in my opinion, maybe too soft and too fuzzy. I, I read the press releases from all these top schools looking for nuggets and pieces and faculty names to feed to my clients. I'm constantly monitoring the, the, the intellectual you know ideas they're coming out of all these top schools and I gotta say I rarely read the stuff coming out of Stanford once in a while there's something interesting about negotiations or once in a while there's something interesting about nonprofits which is something I care about because I used to run one but you know quite frankly it's a valid criticism of Stanford that because it's small they don't really have I think you what you could call bench strength in some of the really core businessy school, business school stuff. That's certainly the East Coast criticism of Stanford. Stanford somehow manages to, to hold its own in some years beating Harvard in the rankings or whatever. I don't think the rankings really matter that much, but Stanford certainly holds its own in many ways. But yeah, you could make the argument that the faculty there is skewed in a, in a few areas and is not across the board. Um, you know, have the... You know, they would argue with me, blah, 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 blah. My point here is that... Um, Look, 
the, it's a school that emphasizes process as much as result. That's what I'm saying. They're going to look to your recommender to validate what's in the resume and the application data forms about your achievements. He or she is going to tell the backstory or the context of how you pulled that off or why it might ma ma matter to your company or to your industry and what truly makes you special, again, within your team or company, organization, country, whatever. That story is a lot more credible than, than the stories you tell in your essays. I'm not saying recommendations matter more than essays, but at Stanford, I'd say they're at least equal. And I, I mean, you know, off the record, I heard the admissions director say a couple years ago when we were meeting him through at the AGOT conference that um, somebody was asking a question in the audience. One of my fellow counselors, AGAC members, was asking, you know, about something, some, something about the essays. And he said very politely, with a great warm smile on his face, he interrupted and he said, look, you know, the essays matter, ma matter more to you than to me. You meaning us consultants. Like, he's pretty sick, uh, I think, of us consultants hyping you, the applicants, up to spend tons of money on our services to make your essays just somehow magical. That's not what I do. What I do is challenge you to get your story straight and really, actually, knock all that other cream and fluff and bad advice you may be getting from others with a very cold and hard perspective to just say, knock it off, be yourself, what are you trying to say? My best advice on the Stanford essays, and I've given this advice, and my best clients, the ones that get in or the ones that take this to heart, is for essay one, essay two, and essay three, especially essay one, write a story that you would be proud to show to your grandchildren. Right? Capture who you are and tell a story that only you can tell and tell it well and tell it from the perspective of, of, of integrity, is, I guess is the way I'll say it. That's my advice with this school and with these essays. Back to essay three though. You could talk about a time in the last three years where you built or developed a team. You could talk about a time in the last three years where you identified and pursued an opportunity to improve an organization. Or you could tell about a time when you went beyond what was defined or established. No matter which one you tell, it's not just about the result. I made X dollars or I closed a deal or I made a breakthrough or uh, made a historical innovation in some way. How you actually got there and the people along the way that you involved, um, right, built or developed a team or identified an opportunity to improve an organization, you better show me that organizational improvement. And it's not going to be just in numbers. It's, again, it's a good mix of the quantitative and the qualitative. But like any good consultant, um, and I know for a fact that consultants had a hand in creating this set of Stanford essays since 2007, they brought in professional consultants to assess their admissions pr process. So this is very much has consulting stamped all over it. So you've got to balance the quantitative and the qualitative. And in essay three, don't forget the result, of course, if it's impressive, include it, but really dig in and tell your story and, and, and talk about the people and the characters in your little movie and, and make me care about them, first of all, as a reader, and, and show me their character development. Make it believable. You can't just jump to, again, a big flashy number, billion dollar profit, hooray, you're in. Um, that's not what this is about. You've really got to dig in and you've really got to tell a story that, that involves personal transformation, both of you and of other people. And you can't just say that. You've got to show it. All right. Um, I have not been conscious of time. This is just over 20 minutes. I'm kind of proud of that. You watch my Harvard videos. Those things are two hours, way too long. I wanted to make this one short. It might be too short, but I'm doing this in the midst of deadline season, so I didn't think I was going to get this out at all. Um, I hope you find this valuable. Give me some critical feedback. I probably can't answer you through email, or I certainly probably can't produce another Stanford video this application season, but I'm always thinking uh, ahead uh, about the future. And uh, these videos, again, are a new thing that I've just gotten started with. Let, if you like it, let me know. If you don't, tell me why. And, and again, thank you for your time and attention. And I'm never going to meet most of you who watch this video. Most of you are never going to even contact me for, for my services. And that's fine. 
I don't like the fact that the, the I like what I do. I like that that it pays my bills and feeds my family, and I like the fact that it it stimulates me, and that I feel that I'm helping people one to one. I don't like what I do in that in the fact that it's not accessible to the people, and that it, that it is in some way just another layer of elite um, exclusion in a process that I think should be more open and should be more transparent. So that is why I spend the time to make these videos. I am giving away the best of what I know um, so that your applications will be honest, will be uh, authentic, will have integrity, and again will be something that you can, you can look back on with, with pride and um, with some amount of, of really feeling that you answered the questions to the best of your ability and really captured who you are and showed them you at your very best. That is always my goal. So, signing off for now. Thanks again for watching. Best of luck to you. Thanks. Bye-bye.